I came to Caltech uh, as a PhD student um, interested in solid state physics and uh, semiconductor physics. And the people doing the most interesting work at Caltech were um, in the applied physics department. So Amnon Yareev, um, Jeff Kimball in the physics department, uh, my advisor, uh, who became my advisor, Axel Scherer. And at the time, this is 1995, um, in that area, you know, uh, the interest in, at least in, in lasers and semiconductor laser physics had moved to more quantum optics uh, applications, so cavity, you know, solid state cavity QED. So that is, you know, how I got inspired um, by some of the atomic physics work that Jeff Kimball was doing um, and the quantum optics work that was coming out at the time. Um, and uh, so that, that was the initial inspiration uh, for myself to move from more engineering applications to um, more fundamental physics. I finished in around 2000 uh, and actually didn't really finish. I started a company at that time and then wrote my thesis over two years and so officially finished around 2002. In physics as a whole, uh, at that time, uh, string theory was the most hot topic, um, and there was lots of discussion about whether string theory was dominating physics. But within my own sort of area, I think, as I mentioned, um, I would say that was sort of the first wave of quantum information science and um, uh, you know applying some of the quantum optics methods as opposed to just studying fundamentals of, of light matter interaction, there was this application of quantum information theory, quantum computing um, that had, you know, really taken off. So that was a, a, an important and hot topic of the time in around 2000, 2001. My interests were, you know, certainly influenced by the, the, this, this area of quantum information science, as I mentioned. So John Preskill and, uh, had started a, um, teaching a class in the mid-1990s, uh, 1995, 1996, on quantum information theory, and, and I would sit in on his uh, inaugural lectures, and that was very inspiring. And so for me, you know, uh, um, personally, my, my dreams and visions are similar to the ones I have now, which were to try to take this, you know, uh, some of the um, engineering, uh, and uh, work I'd done in, with solid-state systems and tried to really develop quantum hardware that could be used to do um, some meaningful, uh, you know, computations or communications uh, using, uh, you know, quantum nature of, 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 uh, of light. So that was, uh, still is a, a vision and, uh, and uh, you know, and a, a driving force behind the work that I do. Many things. I think that I'm maybe not as in touch with nano optics. Uh, you know, I stay in touch uh, maybe more distantly than uh, I did as a graduate student. I think there's been, you know, lots of development, uh, especially with, um, you know, more advanced fabrication tools and people pushing towards smaller and smaller scales, larger and larger, uh, um, you know, uh, um, light matter interactions. Um, as one packs photons into smaller volumes. I think the, uh, you know, there's been a revolution in imaging. So for me, I think there's, you know, and you see that in the symposium that's been uh, held over the last week, there's, a, there's a quite a diverse uh, set of um, research fields that uh, have been making use of what I'll call nano-optics and nano-optic techniques. So I, I, I've been maybe more on the periphery for the last you know, maybe five years, and as I, you know, have gotten more involved, interested in other types of, um, uh, you know, microwave systems and superconducting quantum circuits. So I'm, I'm maybe not in the in, in, in the direct uh, field of nano optics anymore. I'm maybe not considered to be doing that. So, but but I think that for me, what comes to mind is uh, maybe some of the work on, uh, you know, impurities and like color centers, and then also some of the imaging techniques that have been developed. 
um, using uh, uh, various uh, molecules and things of this nature. Well, me personally, when I, um, intuition, uh, but when I was a, a graduate student, um, I spent a lot of time developing numerical tools for doing simulation. Nowadays, of course, you can go and purchase software, but uh, um, when I was uh, doing research, it was, you know, developing finite difference time domain codes, de developing finite element codes. Um, you know, I probably spent uh, a good 30% of my time doing that. And uh, so I do, you know, I did learn quite a bit of, you know, and did utilize numerical methods. But I also, because our, you know, the numerical tools I had were not as powerful or the computers weren't as powerful as they are now, um, I had to rely quite a bit on um, intuition. Uh, and so I think that's very important to have. I see that, you know, if you, rely, you know, certainly with my students, they rely a lot more on numerical methods. But I think that that makes it, uh, you know, there's only so much, uh, so much you can do with just pure numerical methods. You need you need to be having someone you know manage those numerical methods and can and point them in right directions and you know define appropriate fitness functions for your genetic algorithm, for instance. So uh, I think that that's uh, so it, it, it's certainly a hybrid approach um, for me at least. Um, but personally, now I do most of the most most of the intuitive uh, thinking and uh, rely on my students to develop better and better numerical methods. I think that top-down fabrication techniques um, really haven't developed very much in the last 20 years. So again, if I look back at when I was a graduate student, we basically use the same tools. They've improved, but incrementally, um, as we do now. I think there's been development in bottom-up approaches. Uh, I think, uh, you know, development of new types of materials like atomically thin materials and studies of those optically or even, you know, one-dimensional materials like carbon nanotubes. So there has been development, but I would say it's not from a, you know, a f what we think of as a fabrication process, uh, you know, top-down approach. Those tools have, have advanced, but incrementally. Hopefully, the, you know, there'll be, you know, the future advancements will be in taking some of the bottom-up approaches and, and the top-down approaches and combining them in more effective ways. I certainly hope so. I think that um, it'll be vital. I mean, uh, the, you know, the ultimate vision would be to have, you know, some way of creating your, you know, at least depending on your application, but if your application is, you know, some of the you know things I'm interested in, which is to utilize nano optics to do some form of communication or computation, then I think you know the ultimate goal is to develop um, or to be able to create a material from scratch, you know, atom by atom almost, that is tailored uh, to provide the coherence properties you need uh, to provide the polarizability, the um, that you would require, and then somehow integrate it with, you know, tether that, you know, make that structure and tether it in a way that you don't, you know, you don't lose all these properties by interacting with the environment, but yet still be able to connect it to a large, you know, uh, um, slightly larger optical structures. So starting at the nanoscale and moving up to more micro scale, and eventually to, you know, even optical networks. I think that those that sort of approach is 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 not so far from where we might be going, and I would say in the next 10 years, uh, 15 years, that this is something that's we could accomplish if we really worked on it. So uh, you know, developing your own perfect molecule or or, um, or or other sort of quantum emitter, and being able to embed that in a host that uh, uh, you know that does not perturb its you know some of the fine properties you want and then being able to embed that structure in, in some sort of you know, super optical structure that enables you to um, send in light in, in, in preferred channels would be sort of the ultimate vision. And I think that there's a lot of tool and materials advancement that's needed and a lot of you know, fabrication advancement that's needed. Um, but I think it's something that's doable. I think that what I just mentioned with regards to um, developing, depends what you want to do, but certainly there's, there's 
many challenges for, let's say, imaging. Um, if you want to, for biology, let's say, I think there's a huge number of opportunities, continued opportunities there, um, that nano optics will, you know, likely play a role in. Certainly, molecular, uh, you know, optical physics at the molecular scale. Um, I think that that will continue to become, you know, play an important role. I think that the, uh, uh, you know, thinking about it from a, a quantum information science uh, uh, standpoint, I think that this sort of development of, um, you know, a uh, um, ultimate quantum emitter that then could be coupled to, um, you know, very well described optical channels uh, using nano, nano optics. Um, is, is a huge challenge, um, but it's one that's uh, certainly within reach. Uh, so, but I see many, many different challenges that, you know, in different different areas and different, um, you know, research you know, points of focus. So, um, but I have my own personal, you know, set of challenges that I that I'm excited about. Sure. Uh, do I know what it is? Um, let me hazard a guess. Uh, uh, perhaps um, if we take this idea to its end point uh, that we would you know, have coherent uh, quantum systems and we we're able to integrate them at the nanoscale or have, uh, uh, have them you know, coupled together at the nanoscale, then I think it's very likely one could imagine developing um, you know, new forms of quantum matter that involve not just solid massive matter but also photons and where you have some you know binding at the quantum level of, of uh, radiative photons and you know or you know radiative photons play the role of some glue um, to, to, to matter and you're able to generate some very exotic uh, you know very interesting um, quantum many body systems that involve both photons and matter I think that this is um, something that people are talking about now, um, and uh, you know it's very early stages. But this idea of quantum photonic matter could be very interesting, and could leverage a lot of the techniques that we've been developing in, in nano optics um, to to enable and you know the, the studies of uh, these quantum antibody systems, and that would be very exciting because you would have you know again an opportunity to. Uh, this is very be very unique because it's an open system. It's a driven system. Um, it's not uh, the same as let's say you know electronic many body systems, where you have conserved particle number, and uh, and you have an ability to sort of tap in and measure even individual um, you know nanoscopic sites, which is rather difficult if you're talking about single you know multi electron systems and trying to probe what's going on at a single electron level. So I think that, that that area is emerging already, um, and I wouldn't be surprised that it uh, starts to become you know, a very active area of research in the next five years.